John 8, are you guys ready for something you've maybe never heard before? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. If you join on YouTube, it very compatible. You can just watch it, but you but there's nobody watching the chat. It's just it's just going. If you join through Zoom, you have to get on our email list to get the Zoom link. If you join through Zoom, you can talk back and we encourage the talking back. So do you know in John 8, 1 through 11 is this story? And do you know what he wrote in the ground? When he wrote with his finger on the ground and a woman accused of adultery? Nobody does. Do you know why nobody knows what he wrote in the ground? It didn't actually happen. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is hard truth time. One of the reasons we use this NASB Bible is you see this little bracket right here? Kind of small. Vroom. See a little bracket and then the brace. It starts back at the end of seven. And what this Bible translation does is it tells you the verses that were added later. This doesn't show up in the earliest manuscripts at all. And when it does start showing up, it's in different places here. So there's um, a lot of like unan unanimity about this actually not being in the Bible. Now, why is it still there? Because of the numbers. When they put the chapters and the verses in the Bible, they went with the uh, Tyndall or KJV or whatever. So whatever that was, that's where we got the numbers. So if they took it out, it would mess the numbering system up. So what these guys do is they leave it in there and they put it in braces. And then it's up to you to determine whether you want to run with it or not. Uh, there's another, oh, Everett, go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, I I have a uh, interlinear translation and they track various Greek texts. Uh, they track seven different texts that besides the, uh, you know, received text. Yeah, Texas receptacles. Three, three of those texts, have those verses in them. Uh, three others do not. Yep. And one is listed as being in there, but doubtful. Yep. Yep. Um, another reason that it's suspect is the, the phrase, the scribes, um, where John talks about, hey, Todd, um, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman in adultery. The scribes is this is the only place in the Gospel of John where that phrase exists. He never refers to the scribes in the other interactions when the scribes are actually there, right? <laughs> right. So there's a lot of evidence that this isn't actually supposed to be in the Bible. And you know, it get today will get better. There'll be less uncomfortable conversations. No, <laughs> no, there won't. So we're not going to talk about the sand thing. That's why we use the NASB. That's why we use the scholarly references, because we want to get back to first century Christianity, the first century faith. And they didn't, this isn't in there. This isn't in there. And uh, saying it shows up pretty late. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the strange thing about the, this particular area is, is that when other things have been added, it's usually because somebody has an ax to grind and they want to promote their particular perspective. Yeah. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything in this that is promoting a particular perspective. It, it seems to be just a straight account of some event. So it, it's a bit atypical of things that were added to scriptures. I agree with you. It's not like there's no doctrine being established here. It's pretty benign. But um, the one, the people who want to argue for keeping it, they say that um, that it was removed because it made adultery look acceptable, and they wanted to keep they and that. And so they say that that people took it out later that it was in the original, and people took it out because it made it look like Yeshua wasn't condemning adultery, but. Anyway, 
the, the people will tie themselves in knots to keep verses, man. <laughs> but I, I'm with you. I, it doesn't seem to be any reason uh, for this to be there. Yes, sir. Well, it seems to me that this account is actually compliant with Torah because there weren't multiple witnesses condemning this woman. Yeah. So you can't just you can't just accuse somebody of something. There have to be witnesses. And so whether this is real or not. And um, the guy. Where's the guy? Right? <laughs> right? If you you can't you can't Pharisees. Yeah. 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 Well, Russ says it was one of the Pharisees. Yeah. Right. So that's so yeah, it's not even it's not even a bad thing, right? It just isn't there. Yes, sir. No, there's another aspect to it as well, and, and that is that uh, it talks about them uh, you know leaving the area of the temple and coming back the next morning. Well, um, if the uh, great day of the feast uh, was the seventh day, that makes perfect sense because they would come back the next morning for the eighth day. But if the great day of the feast was the eighth day, yeah. everybody would cut out of town. Or yeah, they'd the come back majority. to take down the super, right? They'd be taking it down, yeah. Cut out of town. Right. So they wouldn't come back. Yeah. That was another thing that uh that note that my notes said uh that when I, I I looked around and said, okay, this says it's not there. Why? Right? I didn't just I didn't just take the Bible, I just didn't, didn't, didn't take the translation's word for it, right? I go, why? Why why is it not there? And one of the things is that if you read from John 7 52 to John 8 12, it's a continuation of a conversation. There's no intermission. It makes a lot more sense for him to roll into the next. This is information. Verse 12 is very important information, right? Right. This is very this getting to here is pretty important. So if we go back to 752, and he's saying, you know, they answered him, You're not also from Galilee. Are you searched to see that no prophet arises out of Galilee? So you have you had this this banter where he says he's the river of living water. And if you can believe in him and they're like, Oh, they're saying this is the Messiah. This surely the Messiah is not going to come from Galilee. And you have this entire kerfuffle and that rolls into him saying, then Yeshua again spoke to him saying, I'm the light of the world. And he who follows me will not walk in the darkness and will have light of life. That's smooth, right? Saying, interrupting that teaching and having them bring a woman and caught in adultery is an, is pretty unnatural to the scene. Yeah. I just agreed with you emphatically. Right. <laughs> Moving on. So uh I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk and walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay. Whole sermon off that one, right? Because in Genesis 1. What do we say, right? Bereshi Elohim at Shemayim v'Aretz. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim was moving over the waters. Then Elohim said, "Let there be light," and there was light. The light of the world at creation. Let there be light, and that's Him, right? Because there's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars. There's nothing, and then there's light. And here he is saying, I'm the light of the world. That's pretty important, right? <laughs> and uh, and did you know that the word light, light actually is directly associated with the Messiah? You guys know that? Why? All right. Why? You're nodding. Guys, you said so. <laughs> no, never, never believe that. Not because I said so. Not, no. Where's the trap door? Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so the Messiah, when somebody is anointed to serve Yahweh, they're anointed with olive oil. Olive oil is how they had light in the darkness. So the Messiah, and when King Saul was anointed, Samuel poured olive oil on his head, beaten olive oil. The purpose of that olive oil was not a salad. The purpose of the olive oil 
was the way that that part of the world had light at night. They didn't have wood. They didn't have electricity. They had to burn something. So when we talk about the tin virgins. We talk about having all the oil. We talk about the menorah. The menorah burnt with the particular olive oil. That's the light association. When somebody's anointed to serve Yahweh, they are made a light in the darkness. And so Yeshua is the ultimate light in the darkness. Go ahead. Yeah, so also uh, in the beginning was the word Yeshua. Yeah. Which is also the Torah, which is it's the different. light. Or the, the bar. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then. Because that's the speaking part. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And then you go back to Revelation and you will at night shall be no more. They shall have no need of a lamp or a light of the sun because Yahweh Elohim shall give them light and they shall reign forever and ever. That's a good one. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Very good. Anybody else? So, yeah. So when he says he's the light of the world, he who follows him will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a lot of information to unpack there, but very important. And the Pharisees, they're saying, they're not saying that's not true. They're not going and saying, that's not possible. They're saying, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony isn't true. They're saying they're discrediting him. How? The way we do it today, right? You don't talk about somebody's record. Don't talk about what they said. Find some way to slander them and drag them down. They're not dealing with the subject, right? And the subject is because they knew what the word Messiah meant, right? Mashiach, right? They knew what that meant. So he answered and says, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, but I'm not judging anybody. Even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, I am the, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies, testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. That's This is um, pretty important stuff. Deuteronomy 17, 6. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death, and he shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Okay. You guys have stumbled into a congregation that might be a little different than what you've heard. It's why Yahweh and Yeshua are two that become one. They're separate. Yeshua didn't do Yahweh's, didn't do his own will. He did Yahweh's will. So he came, he was sent, he was completely subordinate to Yahweh, died, resurrected, and now what? Sits at the right hand of Yahweh, and he is coming back to judge everybody. The judgment is based on two witnesses. That's very important because Yahweh gives the Torah to tell us how to live, but also to tell us how he judges. What happened when they were going to take out Sodom and Gomorrah? They sent three to go and investigate it. Go and see if this is true. This ties directly into the adultery thing that we just talked ourselves out of into the Bible, right? <laughs> right? But where's the two, where's the two witnesses? Where's the two people who said that they did it? When they went to put Yeshua to death, they couldn't get two people to corroborate. So they had to make him say something that enraged everybody. So this two witnesses thing, everybody's tied up in the in the prophecy trying to find out who they are. What you need to find out is what are they judging the world on? The Torah. They're judging against the Torah. We've all, since uh, since the Bible was put in print and circulated, the Geneva Bible, all of mankind has had access to the entire Bible. 
and we're going to be held to account. How are we supposed to live according to the Torah? How did the Messiah live? He says, if you walk in the light, you're, you're, um, I don't want to misquote. He says, if you walk in the light, oh, you don't walk in the darkness. What's the difference? It goes to what you just said. The Torah is the light. It's showing you the way, the truth, and the life. Is walking in the Torah, is walking the way Yeshua did, is walking the way his father intended everybody to walk, get in the light, stay in the light. Does it matter who the two witnesses are? If the two witnesses come and accuse and say, you were a sinner, and you go, show me my sin. Not saying you can earn salvation. You can't, right? We Yeshua died for us. He paid the penalty for sin. And then we accept him as the Messiah, and we live the way he lived. We live according to Torah. We learn, we study, we get rid of our old ways, we adopt the new ways. Okay? I'm sure somebody has something to say. I have to pause for a second. Well, anyway, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's. So it's talking about the judgment here. The other week we talked in John 5, we talked about the resurrection of judgment from Revelation 20. The second resurrection is a resurrection of judgment where there's a decision made. Those who are not found written in the book of life are condemned. Those there are, That means there are people at the second resurrection who are found written in the book of life. And they're judged. The judgment occurs based on how they live their lives. And that standard, it comes into the Torah. Did they love God with all their heart, with all their soul and all their might? Did they love their neighbor as their self? Did they do the deeds? Or, or, or if they were bad people, what's the context of that? Because Yeshua came to be tempted in all ways, so that way he is qualified to judge everybody. He came and, and suffered and died an innocent death after being tempted by Satan and tempted in all ways, it says. I don't know. I don't know. I, it seems hard to say that he was tempted in all ways, right? But because, you know, he was, it says what it says, but it's not like, um, anyway. <laughs> but uh, he goes and says, the testimony of two is true. I am he who testifies about myself and the father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Yeshua answered, you neither know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Okay, now he's poking at him. Now he's really getting them upset, right? There, these guys, as we've been talking about, I forget which chapter, it might have been John 5 as well, how these people have set themselves up as the mediator between God and men. That's what happens with ministry, with big churches, with the Pharisees. They always end up with because you said so, right? You pointed, you pointed at me. No, 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 right? <laughs> That's not the way to go, right? Um, and so they set themselves up as a false mediator. He's the real mediator. And so they're they're pretty upset at him at here. But nobody seized him because his hour had not yet come. So it seems like they were mad enough to take him out. They were already mad enough to take him out because he healed somebody on the Sabbath, right? And that kept coming up. They kept, uh, they kept, they really got stuck in their craw. They wanted him taken out because of that. And now here he is saying, you don't even know the father. They're probably just, <laughs> right? I want to take him out. So that actually goes with the fact that, that they are probably still at the last day of the feast, whether that be seven or eight Everett, right? <laughs> right? There's still thousands of people present. Right? So they're not going to let their rage go. He's using all those people as insurance, as life insurance. So, so that's probably why they're not taking them out. Um, anyway, I go away. Is this the right spot? Yeah, he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, so no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. He said again, I go away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So they were saying, the Jews were saying, he's not going to kill himself, is he? <laughs> right, right. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you're from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We're going to get to this I am business here in a minute, okay? Um, so they were saying to him, who are you? Yeshua said to them, 
What have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Yeshua said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, So, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And he spoke these things, and many people came to believe in him. So, oh man, 23 to 27. People believed in him because of this exchange. That one, if out of the blue, this was the day I met Yeshua. And I'm at the temple celebrating the feast. And the first time I meet this guy, he's talking like this. I'm going to go away. You can't find me. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Very cryptic language. Do you guys find it interesting that people came to believe in him because of this exchange? I don't think so. I think there was something else. Yeah. I'm thinking spiritual, because I mean, if he's speaking this corrupt, not corrupt, um, cryptic language, maybe they felt something spiritually. All right, it's entirely possible. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I can't. I mean, we can't unlearn and and put ourselves in their shoes that much. But this just seems, you know, probably wrapping it all together as one event. That makes more sense. If we take from John 7 all the way through to here and we don't have the break, it makes a bit more sense. All right. 31. So Yeshua was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and your truth will make you free. Okay, this should, this should put a needle across a record, right? Because what does mainstream Christianity teach us? that the Jews rejected the Messiah. They say they rejected him. We know that's poppycock, right? We know it says right here, right? right. This John was written like late. Some say this was written even after the fall of the temple, right? So we, when he says those Jews who have believed in him, he means it. And we also know when the 5,000 were baptized, the 3,000 were baptized, what religion were they, right? Those guys weren't Southern Baptists. Those are Jews, right? <laughs> right. So the Jews did believe in him. Go ahead, Ross. <laughs> Maybe they were reformed. <laughs> That's reformed. <laughs> there you go. So, um, so that's that's very noteworthy. And they come back and they say, We're Abraham's descendants and have yet never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Oh, you haven't been enslaved, have you? <laughs> Abraham's descendants haven't been enslaved. That's the biggest, the biggest miracle of a Jewish person is the Exodus. Our fathers were under the cloud. Isn't that what Paul says? Isn't that how they relate to each other? Their whole thing about freedom versus slavery, and for them saying they've never been enslaved to anyone, there's a little bit more hubris there, right? Because who's running the world right now? Rome. No, I meant no, not right now. Oh. I'm not, I'm, I'm at, yeah. Was Rome the deep state back then? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were. They were every state, deep, tall, wide, far. You were gonna say something, young lady? I asked a question and you stuck your hand up, and I didn't catch it in time. Well, I thought you said about today, I'm like, oh well, every, oh. Every day. Amen. There you go. All right. Young lady just said that Yahweh runs the world every day. <laughs> she set me straight. There you go. <laughs> right. But these guys in this context of the first century in Judea are not allowed to do anything unless Rome lets them do it. They have a garrison there. They are under complete occupation. So they're not free right then. At all. In fact, why are they listening to the Messiah? 
because they're looking him for him to be a military leader that's going to rid them of the Roman occupation. So he uh, switches gears and said, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things I have seen with my father, therefore you do the things which you heard from your father. Okay. This started with him addressing the people who believed in him. And he's poking them hard. Any ideas why? Why didn't he take the win? Right? He was saying to those Jews who had believed in him. Maybe he's talking to the Jews who just immediately stopped believing in him. I, I read that as him talking to the people that were believing in him at, at the time. And now he's really like, you're trying to kill me. Right? Had believed in him in the past tense. Right. Yeah. She says, had believed in him as past tense. Maybe, maybe that's it. So, Terry? He also knew their heart. So even though they said they believed, he probably knew they truly did not believe or not 100% 100 commitment. All right. That's cool. So, if when he says you're Abraham's descendants, yet you're trying to kill me, and that you're of the your father, the father that's trying to kill them, who is that? Who is the who is he calling your father? Yes, ma'am. Emma. He's talking about I'm guessing the devil. Okay. All that's true, but it's a little twist on it. It's probably talking about Cain. Probably talking about Satan and Cain at the same time, right? It's both things at the same time. Because Cain slew Abel. He was a murderer from beginning. And the descendants of Cain are the bad guys. All through all the way up until here, which also it also equates to them being uh sons of Satan as well. Thank you. Good answer. Good job. Okay. There's Ross. Yeah, I was thinking Esau tried to kill Jacob. Yeah. The king of Judea at the time was an Edomite, the synod of Esau. There you go. Mm -hmm. All true. Yeah. So, yeah. And so for you guys who are visiting, the, the way the scriptures come out is that it's not like Greek where it's either this is true or that's true. Right? You can have true, true, true. You can have prongs. You can have... Uh, different levels of scripture. You can have the same thing happen a couple of times and still going to happen in the future, right? So people think, uh, read it from the Western point of view, that 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 AD 70 is the fulfillment of the of all the bad stuff in Revelation. And it's like, well, not quite, right? <laughs> right? We have another 2,000 years to go. So, so this is something where it's okay for all of these answers to be true and, and right at the same time. So, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. <laughs> this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I've not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Pause. Always subordinate. The whole gospel is about Yeshua being completely subordinate to Yahweh to the point of death, where he has victory over death, resurrected by the Father, 40 days, meets with the disciples, tells them everything, ascends, sends the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Whole gospel, right there, right? And that's our model. Our model is study Torah and be fully subservient to Yahweh. Even if we switched it and said we were going to be fully subservient to Yeshua, we would 
still be fully subservient to Yahweh because we would be following his example to arrive in the same exact point, right? And so he's telling them, I've come forth from God, and I didn't come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Very important. God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only forgot, only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Next line, for God did not send the son of the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him, right? So he's telling them the same story over and over and over. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Point to Emma, right? <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. It does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he told Eve, surely you will not die, he murdered her. He was the murderer, right? And then their offspring follows suit. The bad line of Cain follows, follows suit. And does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Ooh. Ouch. You know why they don't want to believe him? Because they want to be the owners of the truth. They want to have it all locked up and divvied it out. Or but they want to rule. They want to rule. It's all about politics. Power. That's right. That's Catholic Church. <laughs> Dude, the fact that they became exactly what they were not supposed to be <laughs> to become <laughs> is very ironic. But remember earlier, I think it was John 5, where they said these people don't even know the Torah. The Jews, the actual teachers of the Torah, can sell the people, you don't know the Torah. Well, whose fault is that? They right. taught, they, like he said, it, they would teach it in Moses' seat, but they didn't act it out. So they did it with their mouth in the Moses, in the temple or the sanctuary, wherever they mm -hmm. were teaching. Um, but then they would go off and be a hypocrite. Oh, yeah. So he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Oh, boy, they're not happy. Right now, they call him a Samaritan. Pretty much the worst thing they could call him, right? And they don't like the Samaritans at all. Okay, okay. Horrible, horrible people, right? Did we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? He says, I don't have a demon. He didn't refute the Samaritan part, right? <laughs> like, like, why did he do that, right? I honor my father and you dishonor me. What is that a reference to? Do, do, do. Hope I can find it. Maybe it's in my cheats. Oh, nope, they didn't catch it. Do, 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 do. <sighs> the words are small. Do homage to the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may be soon kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice in trembling. Do homage to the son. Other translations say honor the son that he not become angry. He was quoting Psalm 2 about himself being the son of God. He's talking to them in their language. That's how they communicate. When you see the people cite the scriptures in the first century, when they're talking to each other, they do it so fluidly, it's like Americans talking about football, right? If we say Harrison Butker, everybody in Kansas City knows exactly who we're talking about. If they talk, then for them, their biggest thing in their life was the Bible, knowing the Bible inside and out, if you're a Pharisee, right? Because the other groups didn't do the whole Bible. Right. So when he says, honor the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, they should have caught that. And if you notice, my these cheats didn't catch it either. But he says, um, which one of you, if I speak truth, you who hears is of God, who hears the words of God. For this reason, you don't hear them because you're not of God. 
saying you're not honoring him because you're not of Yahweh. You're not honoring Yeshua. You messed up. So anybody want to talk about that one before we go on? I wish I had thought of all this stuff when I was writing this paper. <laughs> so, okay. It's going to get pretty technical and boring here in a minute. But the Jews said and answered, do we not rightly say you're a Samaritan? Okay, I don't, but I honor my father, you dishonor me. I do not seek my glory. There's one who seeks and judges. So that's very important there. He didn't, he came to seek the will of Yahweh to give Yahweh all the credit. What does Satan do? He wants the glory for himself. All the murderers, all the bad guys, all the people who take the wrong track are looking to glorify somebody other than Yahweh. So I don't, he says, I don't seek my own, my glory. There's one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Remember, he started out, I'm the light of the world. Right? So he's referring back to that. Okay? The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, if anybody keeps my word, he'll never taste death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets did too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Whew. Right? He is saying some big stuff there. Yes, dear. But I thought Isaiah didn't die. Isaiah went up. You mean Elijah? Elijah, whatever. Yeah. Whatever his name is. Yeah. I can't get it with those eyes. Eyes, 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 eyes. Eyes. I agree with you that Elijah and Enoch were taken up. So, yeah, I agree with you that those two were carried off, translated, trans taken somewhere else, right? And so it's, yeah, I'm with you. But he, but they, um, he's saying Abraham saw his day and he saw it and was glad. So it's entirely possible that the prophets of old knew more about Yeshua than they wrote about, Okay. So if those guys were carted off, I mean, who do you think was walking around in the garden, right? <laughs> right. You know, he was there, right? They knew him. They walked in the light and they made it. Okay. So the Jews said, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. What did they not say? You didn't just claim to be Yahweh, did you? They said, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. He said he pre-existed, flat out, right? But taking this I am to be the Exodus 3 I am, bit of a problem with that because it doesn't match. We're going to get into that technical detail here in a second. If you notice, I don't know if you saw throughout, but in verse 24, he says, I am he. The he is in italics. Okay, he never said the he part. They plugged it in, right? This is ego ami in Greek. Okay, in verse twenty-eight, he says I am, and they put in the he. He says ego ami ami, right? E m i a. In verse, in this verse, which one is it? Fifty-eight. He said exactly the same thing, and they didn't put the he. I, it's hard for me to be critical of this in ASB, but remember with John 5, he said the same thing three times, and the KJV put different words in, right? Here, he said the same thing three times, and they made a boo-boo. Now, the people who write the NASB are never going to put that he in, he in there, right? They're, they're Sunday people, right? So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Yeshua himself hid in the temple and went out. So he... Just prior said, his father is our God, right? And he says, I am, but he says, I am he. Now we're going to look at some technical stuff. Hopefully I left it right here. Um, this one. Yeah. How did that come out so small? So in John 58... If you look at the I am, it just has this. In Exodus 3.14, there's another 
letter in there, right? So what happens in Exodus 3.14 is they are taking a totally different set of words. In Hebrew, if you say, are you Chris? I would say, ani, A-N-I, I am, okay? And that's how you say, I am in Hebrew. In Exodus 3.14, Yahweh doesn't say he's I am. He says haya asher haya, which is three words, which is a play on the verb to be. That means I, I exist. I am a self-existent being. He's saying something that doesn't come into English. He's saying I am, I have no beginning, I have no end, I have no top, I have no bottom, no bottom. I am, I am, right? Meaning I span all of time all of everything. When they translated that to Greek, they made it say, I am the one being, right? Meaning I am the one who exists, being, not being, uh, just uh, just trying to, to bring into Greek this concept of a completely eternal being that none of us can comprehend because we're not that. We're temporal beings, right? I said something a minute ago. Yahweh doesn't say something a minute ago. He says something, and he will say it, and he has said it, all at the same time. That's what they're trying to put in here into Greek. What happened when that came into English is they said, I am. Right? Now, then people look at the New Testament and they say, well, whatever Yeshua says, I am, that means he's claiming to be that being. But, but he says, I am, a lot. Right. And other people say I am a lot. And they're saying the same exact words, but they're not having this 3588 word in there. So he totally told him he existed beforehand. He totally told him he was the, the light of the world. But to if he had claimed, if he had said Haya Asher Haya, right? Before Abraham was Haya Asher Haya, that would have been that would have been the end of it. They'd have gone to war over that. And so that's what I was wanting to explain. Anybody else want to add something to that? That's very short, ex short explanation of why that I am doesn't actually equate. Oh no, am I ever going to find that again? So when he says before Abraham was born, I am, he's absolutely telling him that he has existed at least since the, since the foundation of the world, right? He did. Don't let there be no doubt, but he's still, there's still somebody above him, right? He came not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. And they're really mad at him about it. So I was really kind of banking on you guys wanting to talk about that because this is the end of the chapter, right? <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, Isaiah 64, seven, and eight is an interesting one because in in the New Testament, they never actually used the names, right? Um, but the Greek, the Greek doesn't. You know, you might have something over there that has the names in it. But um, so, if you see a Bible that puts the names in the New Testament, there is the right way to do that because if you go to when the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament. And it's talking about the Lord, right? L-O-R-D. You can go from that verse to the Old Testament and see whether it meant Adonai or whether it meant yod heh vav -Heh, right? Most of the translations that put the, the names in the New Testament, they do control F, change Jesus to Yeshua in, <laughs> right? Right? And they that that's not the way that was supposed to work. But in Isaiah 64, 7, and 8, there is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. But now, O Yahweh, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. All of us are the work of your hand. So I just wanted to, to show you guys the verse a verse, an easy verse, to tie the Father to yod heh vav -Heh, right? Even I say Yahweh, other people say it differently. 
So I just wanted to say, and and who's the potter, right? You know, he's a potter, whatever. So, and if we go to Isaiah 52, 10, it's 52. Yahweh has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our Elohim. I did a little translating in there for you, right? But I didn't do the right word. Yahweh has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see the Yeshua of our Elohim. Ah, salvation comes through Yeshua. There's no there's salvation in no other name. Who is Yahweh's holy arm? Yeshua is his holy arm, right? Because this word salvation here is actually the word Yeshua. Don't have to believe me. I'd rather insist on it. Um, Yeshua, H3444. So when you know to look for this, you can see that Yahweh chose to save us by sending his son and naming him salvation. So there's this double meaning when he says their salvation is found in no other name. It's almost a joke because he was actually named salvation. When Mary told him as a little boy to come get dinner, she said, salvation, dinner's ready. Just like if you were to name a girl Grace today, which my granddaughter is named Grace. She's just not here today, right? And so, so that's that's um, more name stuff. The other thing I was going to talk about today is um, last night's study. Uh, my friend Tagore, and he is my friend, said that because Yeshua was named Emmanuel, that meant God with us, which it does. But what it's really saying, okay, is, um, bless you, Todd. You all right? You alert, Emmanuel. Seeing if you were allergic to that name. <laughs> it was, it was not, <laughs> so Emmanuel is saying God is with us. If you think about when was he born, after the years of silence, right? The years of silence is when Malachi is written, Malachi, the last book of the Tanakh. Then you have these 400 and something years. I'm looking at Marcin because he's the kind of guy who would know that off the top of his head. <laughs> you know? All right. So the years of silence, you get the Messiah. So by naming him Emmanuel, they're saying God has not forgotten about us, that we have the Messiah. After all these years, we haven't had a prophet. We haven't had anything. Now we have the Messiah, Right. That's very important information because we need to read the we need to read the Bible from the Hebraic perspective, right? If we read it from the Sunday perspective, this guy named Jesus, long hair, blue eyed dude, showed up, died for our sins, right? <laughs> right? And and that and they they start the story from there. We don't start the story from there. We start the story from Genesis one. The plan of salvation was established at the foundation of the world. So that you have all of this coming and going. You have the first creation. You have the fall. You have all of man becoming evil. You have the flood. You have eight people coming through the flood, reestablishing mankind. You have the creation of the Tower of Babylon. And you have men scattered all over the world and languages uh, messed up, confused, so that people can't cooperate to that degree anymore. Then you have the Abraham... Isaac and Jacob, you have 70 people go into Egypt, you have 2 million people come out, a mixed multitude, not just Hebrews. It's a mixed multitude. It's very important for us because we're part of that mixed multitude today. We are grafted into a vine that already exists. We are just out of the blue, people picking up the Bible and going, wait a minute, I need to read this whole thing, right? And then I need to do this whole thing, right? And you start doing it. So then the 70 people come out and you start the, uh, the Torah from Mount Sinai. You have the conquest of Canaan. You have all of the apostasy and then you have the restoration and then you have the establishment of the temple and you have the um, apostasy that Solomon brought in with all of the people, right? Then you have, uh, uh, they're scattered 500 years goes by, they get taken into Babylon, 70 years, one year for each Sabbath.
Sabbath if they don't take, Sabbath year they don't take, they get restored, Nehemiah and Ezra, and then you have the re restoration of Judea, and you have kind of a wimpy temple made. Remember, they were all crying. The people that saw the old one were crying because the old one was so much better than the new one, right? They restores it, and then you have nothing. You have nothing, right? It's silence. And you would think that Yahweh forgot about them, with the exception of the Maccabean revolt, which was a wonderful thing. And I wish, I wish the Maccabees were scripture, but they are not. I'm not going to mess with the canon of scripture. 66 books is fine for me, right? And so then you have this, this period of silence, and then you have the Messiah who came at the right time. The prophecy of, the, of, of Daniel said, from the going forth of the restoration to build the temple, so till the Messiah, the prince, will be such and such years. It happened that he happened to die exactly at that time interval, a 490-year swish, nothing but net. That's Emmanuel. God hasn't forgotten about us. What are we looking around today? Why don't we see any miracles? Why are the churches dying? What The same cycle is happening. Yeshua came at the right time. He lived. He died. He was resurrected. The Holy Spirit came down. The apostles went out to the synagogues that were all exactly where they were supposed to be so that you would have people planted all over the world that knew what a Messiah was. There does no good to go preach the Messiah to somebody who believes that Apollo is a god. They have no idea what a Messiah is. You have to have seeds all over the world. Paul walks into the synagogue. Why is Paul chosen? Because Paul could walk into any synagogue in the world and say, my name is Paul of Tarsus. Well, sir, why don't you come up here and speak to us? He was a world-renowned rabbi, had authority, had a history, goes in, preaches the Messiah to people who are ready to hear it. Then it grows, and the uh, Gentiles start coming and showing up. Now they're like, wait a minute, what do we do with these guys? Oh, somebody's flagging me down. Go ahead. Did I forget something? Uh, I probably opened up a can of worms, but I can remember Jesus telling his disciple, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And after he died, many of them went to Scythia and Parthia. And Thomas uh, supposedly died in South India. Southwest India. Yeah. With so, Scythians, um, after the Parthian Empire fell, they went into Europe. So almost that group could have been Israelites or Jewish people. It, people take the he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and they no that, no that's not yeah. what I think it's yeah. what he said originally and then twice, and later on after he died he said to go to the whole world. Yeah right right right. Okay so um so that's what I thought you were saying that he only went oh. to the lost sheep. No oh. no what I was thinking uh, is the Scythians after the Parthian Empire fell. Went to Europe. So my question is, do you think it's possible that some of the Israelites are mixed into with them? Yeah. yeah I possible. think so. I don't know. My DNA came up with 100% honky. So <laughs> my I am 58% German and uh, the rest of it is Irish. And then Diana got hers checked and she's about the same British, and the rest of it is Eastern European. So, not a nothing else. I mean, it, it, the purity of our 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 purity is is not something that you would statistically expect, right? You would expect a Native American in there, right? You would expect something, right? After being on this, con our, our my ancestors have been on this continent since 1550. So you would expect some kind of mixing in there, and there's nothing. 1550? Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The first DeWeese that came over was a Church of England minister. Well, I've been 1650 then. Not to me. Yeah. That doesn't matter. Oh, all right. Yeah, my, I, uh, my other, uh, my um, brother-in-law uh, went through and traced the entire family history and showed it to me. I was like, well, that's interesting, right? So we went we went down the male side 
the father's side of my mom and the father's side of my dad. And it's, we've been, my ancestors were here for every war. Do you know what that means? Either they were good at war or they were cowards. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> they all lived like to 60, 70, 80 years old through famine, pestilence, war. But at any rate, that's a tangent. But I was fully expecting some deviation in the heritage. And so, you know, maybe there's something to that, you know, I don't know. But the rest of my family has nothing to do with the Bible. So I don't think that heredity had anything to do with this. I think we were just called by the Ruach. And that was that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so when the Messiah comes, it's at the right time. And then we have a big, we have the Roman Empire, which Yahweh used to facilitate the, to give a national uh, empire of an international empire that allowed the gospel to be spread. Paul's a Roman citizen and a Pharisee. He's allowed to move freely around the world. And then he uses his Roman citizenship to get an audience with Caesar in a way that nobody saw coming. Okay. He appeals his innocence to Caesar because Yahweh wanted Caesar to hear the gospel. That starts hundreds of years of, uh, you know, Christianity was born, and it's pretty good for the first hundred years. And then it's not so good. Then it gets worse, <laughs> right? And all these intervals happen. And I'm, I'm going off on this tangent, tangent about what Emmanuel means. It's meaning that whenever we think it's lost, whenever we think he's forgotten about us, he hasn't. It's just not time yet. He is letting things get as bad as he as they're going to get. You know, we look around today, and you know, I like to watch the Olympics, and I only know of two athletes that thanked God out on their speeches. The rest of them were all about self determination, and they did it, and they worked for it, and they didn't say anything about God whatsoever. We are we are falling away at such a rapid pace that it's astonishing. And now they're shutting down the media in Europe because Europe is having riots between, uh, Britain rather, they're having riots between the native-born Britons and the Muslims. Because the native-born Britons have realized that they've made a mistake. And now you can't even get video feeds and stuff coming out of Great Britain, which is very scary times. And so we look at these things getting bad. For us, we need to take comfort in them getting bad because it says it's going to get bad. The man of lawlessness to be revealed, the fullness of the Gentiles has to come in, right? If it doesn't get bad, then we would be worried. Everett probably wants to say something. I've only been talking for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I did have one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, on verse 29, uh, he who sent me is with me. Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Uh, it seems to me that that's the key to maintaining a relationship with your creator, is to always do what pleases him. I, I think we mess up when we sin, when we value something more than we value our relationship with him and so right. if you want if you want to quit sinning ask yourself the question what is this going to do to my relationship with yeshua there you go yeah let's say that's right on point too because of all the people that we listed out were the murderers the murderers how does it start yeshua says it starts when you think evil of your brother when you think I should have that. I should have that blessing. I should have that favor. I should have that thing. And then things spiral out of control. Yeah, he also mentioned in this, uh, yeah, in verse 15, uh, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. But that, that was not his job at that time, yep. is condemning other people and, and taking their inventory, as they say, and uh, pointing fingers and that sort of stuff. That was... 
not his job and it's not our job. Yeah. And that's one where I go, I see these people online calling everybody heretics. Oh, you're a heretic. You're a heretic. You're a heretic. And I just, I made this video and I'm like, who do you think you are? <laughs> who, what Bible are you reading that you think that you could call somebody else a heretic? Right. How did that work out? What are we reading right here? They're trying to get him to call himself a heretic so they could kill him. Don't people realize that when you start judging people like that, that violence is right around the corner. They're thinking evil. Then we got to fight that out. Yeah, you're right. He's not judging anybody. That They kind of wanted him to. They wanted to make him the king. But um, Then at the end of it, it says, all judgment has been given to me, right? After he's resurrected, it says all judgment has been given to him. He didn't have it at this point, but after he overcame, he got it. All right. Anybody else?